Hello and welcome to the Print Soft Cover. It was on 14th of Feb 2019, three years ago, that a Jeshi Muhammad terrorist rammed his explosive laden vehicle into a CRPF convoy, killing 40 Javans. The investigation into the case went on for a year, but hit a dead end as investigators were not getting much. The reason being that many of the key suspects were dead in encounters by JK police and the other handlers were sitting in Pakistan. So how did the conspiracy of Pulwama terror attack, the, dust, the most dastardly attack in the history of India, unravel? What was this conspiracy? Who was the mastermind? And what is the story of this region that has been marred with conflict for about decades? To discuss this and more, we have with us today Mr. Danish Rana, who is an IPS officer and is posted as the ADGP in Kashmir. He has dealt with militancy through his career and has written a terrific book on this subject, which is called As Far As the Saffron Feels, The Pulwama Conspiracy. He has also written another book, Red Maze, in 2015, which was also given the Tata Literature Line First Book Award in the fiction category. Welcome to the print, sir. Thank you. Uh, so to, before we start uh, with the conversation about the book and how you went about uh, writing it, I'd just like to um, unveil this book which we have in a, a packet here. The book is called As Far As the Saffron Feels, The Pulwama Conspiracy and was published by HarperCollins. Many congratulations on the book, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, to start the conversation, if you could tell us something about the book and how did you uh, get the idea of writing one? What, uh, how did it strike you that this should be in fact turned into a book and where did you find the time? Uh, <clears throat> at the very outset, let me uh, uh, thank you for having me here and uh, uh, unveiling my book and uh, having this online launch. Uh, as far as the idea about the book is concerned, if you go through author's note, which is at the end of the book, I very clearly mention how it, it sprouted in my brain and how I went about writing this book. Basically, after the charge sheet was presented by NIA, uh, obviously they did marvelous work and all the investigation they did and how they unraveled this whole plot. Is, is itself a case study, which is which is commendable work done by NIA. They had presented a 13,900-page charge sheet in NIA court in Jammu. Prior to that, there was a cover story in India today, which was, uh, I think, in 2020, if I'm, if I'm right, August 2020, uh, cover story called The Bomb Maker of Pulwama, wherein they had uh, kind of summarized the whole plot and I had read that. I read that because uh, it was there on my WhatsApp and uh, it, it really intrigued me. And at the same time, it fascinated me because it, it's meticulous uh, uh, investigation that has been done by NIA. So the idea emanated from that story. And when I actually got hold of this mammoth document, which ran into 13,500 pages, I could uh, kind of you know club together uh, going through the disclosure statements, going through the evidence which was collected by NIA, and I could uh, reconstruct this story. And while I was writing it, initially I thought that, uh, you know, the, just writing about one incident, if I am able to write about 150 pages, that would be very nice. But as I started my research for this work, there are many other connected stories uh, which I learned and which had uh, directly or indirectly uh, which are related to the, the present scenario that we have in South Kashmir, which is very volatile in these five districts. Right. So, in fact, I have read the book myself and uh, I was amazed to read how you have reconstructed the entire conspiracy uh, point by point, giving time codes, dates, um, and, you know, the conversations between the accused and what the charge sheet has as evidence. So, so the Pulwama conspiracy, in fact, intrigued a lot of people who were thinking after the attack that how did 200 kg of explosive actually land up in India? How did it cross the border? And of course, the book explains everything and it has all your answers. So just, uh, I would not like 
like to divulge much because I would like the read uh, what viewers to read the book. But if you could tell us something about that key evidence, which is a mangled phone, and that is the first chapter also in your book that actually led to uh, basically opened a window uh, for the case. Initially, as I said in my introduction, also that it had the investigation almost hit a dead end because uh, all the suspects were uh, dead uh, in encounters, rest were across the border. So that was like one. Uh, kind of window that the investigators caught that phone and then once that phone was opened it just opened Pandora's box absolutely but uh, the phone happened about uh, nine months later eight nine months later before that also NIA had a very definitive line of investigation and uh, if you if obviously you have read the book I have uh, singled out three initial points uh, which 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 uh, kind of marked their line of investigation right. a they, they wanted to know uh, what was the make of this vehicle, what was the model of this vehicle, yes. and find out who, who was the owner of this vehicle. Obviously, investigation starts like that. B, they wanted to know the identity of, uh, of the killer, of the, of the suicide bomber, which obviously uh, was already on media, on social media, because immediately after, the, uh, after this uh, attack, the, the video of Adil, Yes. Uh, was out in, in less than 10 minutes. But then uh, that could have been some kind of a smoke screen as well. Therefore, in order to actually know the identity, you obviously need DNA samples and you know, things like that. Right. Third was the use of explosives. Like you uh, very rightly said that 200 kg of explosives were used in this blast. I have tried to construct that story also from where did these explosives emanate for right. example, you talk with, I talk about urea being used and uh, uh, 35 to 40 kgs of RDX being used. And uh, I have uh, tried to connect all the dots uh, right. in a chapter called in a, in a chapter called uh, where the bomb making is you know, shown in details. So, so that that would probably uh, help the readers to understand uh, how how this uh, the, how the bomb was assembled and how finally it was executed. Right. So what about the phone? In fact, uh, uh, if you could tell our viewers in brief as to what uh, what key evidence did the phone throw up eventually? See, what I'm what all I'm saying here is already it is on the public domain. You know, uh, there are numerous articles written about uh, this dis the discovery of the phone. Uh, in fact, when the investigation was hitting one roadblock after other, then uh, the investigators obviously led by, by supervisory officers, senior officers, they decided to study all the encounters which had taken place in recent times uh, involving Jaish-e Mohammed, right. you know? Right. So uh, they did a detailed study on all these encounters and stumbled upon the Sutsu Kalna operation where two militants, one of them known as Idris Bai, got killed. And they, and the police had already seized a phone from that. and. It was studied. It was a damaged phone. It was a mangled phone. Uh, some of the data was uh, recovered by local agencies, but uh, eventually it was sent to Delhi for experts to study it. And with help of cyber forensics, they were able to crack open this phone. And that obviously opened everything that was associated with this bomb which yeah. uh, you will find in the book as well. Right, right. So while uh, you must have seen so many investigations and uh, in cases that you must have dealt with in your career, so what was uh, the most, say, attractive part of this investigation, Pulwama investigation, that, uh, uh, that, that you know, you think uh, that, you know, you have not seen in your career? Was it something that struck out for you in this particular investigation as a police officer? See, one, I was... Uh, not directly involved with this investigation, but I have just studied it. I have uh, spoken to people. I have interacted with uh, some of these so-called protagonists of this whole conspiracy. I've spoken to them. Uh, it is it is meticulous investigation. The evidence collection has been uh, very good. The dots have been connected in a very meaningful way, mm -hmm. and uh, there is a uh, there is a story that runs through. You know, right. and. The, 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 the evidence uh, that they have, both material evidence, scientific evidence, corroborative evidence, and nothing out here is just, you know, shooting in the dark. Yeah. If I say that this, if, if I say Shakir Bashir bought urea from a particular place, right. this, is corroborated, this is corroborated with evidence, right. with call detail records, 
with his presence being you know at that particular place when he had bought that uh, material and uh, there are you know sometimes there are documentary proofs also the bill the bill is there he has been billed for that then there are witnesses by you know uh, by the shopkeeper and who probably doesn't know why he is buying this urea right that, that is the beauty of this investigation that everything that uh, they have claimed here has been very meaningfully backed by good solid concrete evidence right right so if you could give our viewers a peek into the life of umar because you have collected excellent details uh, about umar uh, uh, what what all was there in his phone in fact his love life all of those so if you could just give us a peek into umar's life because he's one of the key um, i would say the key uh, uh, terrorist who was who executed the pulwama conspiracy see umar alvi is uh... Ibrahim Alvi's son, Ibrahim Alvi is Mulana Masood Azhar's elder brother who was instrumental in IC814 hijacking from Kathmandu. Right. So it, it runs in the family. Terror runs in the family. These, I can assume, obviously I would have liked to know more about his life in Pakistan, but whatever I have tried to construct is through the videos and you know messages that I've recovered from his phone. And I've uh, written extensively about his, uh, uh, you know, uh, his love for cricket, his uh, his touring about in you know some of these places in in in, in Pakistan, uh, his uh, obsession with his smartphone, of his obsession with taking selfies. So I have tried to from bits and pieces I picked up from his life whatever I knew, but I can assume that he has grown up in an environment where in they have been groomed in a way that one fine day the only motive that you have in your life is to go to Kashmir and you have to fight for so-called the struggle or the conflict which is going on there. Hmm. Umar intrigued me because of his commitment to the resolve that he had to carry out uh, these terrorist activities in Kashmir and the way he executed this blast, how religiously he was committed to this cause and how indifferent he was to the loss of Adil Dar who actually rammed his vehicle and who had spent a lot of time with him. So on one side, he's committed to his cause. On the other, he is ready to do anything for it. Right. And he did not, he did not even stop at, at this, you know. This this had not quenched his thirst. He wanted more direct strikes. Yes. And In fact, that I was have... my next question to you that you also yes. mentioned that there, there was another plan after this because uh, this had not, I mean, uh, he was, he was, there were chats with his operatives in Pakistan there and they were planning something more. So do you yes. have uh, some more information on that aspect? Yes, it is. It is corroborated by some of these voice notes that I've heard that this guy is desperate to carry out and replicate Pulwama because he thought it was his moment of glory. Right. So he has been he has been desperately trying to impress on his uh, uh, handlers in Pakistan, who are mostly from his family, one of his uncles, and you know, to to give them the permission to carry out another attack right. for which he had which for which he had already wrecked certain uh, targets. Right. He had started to assemble that bomb also, and he was in the process of uh, preparing a fidain for that also. Right. And the strange part is strange part is Shakir Bashir was also in his mind hmm. when he thought that he could be the he could be his man Friday again and because yeah. he has done so much for him and the thoughts also came to his mind about uh, his so-called girlfriend Incha also you know this I learned uh, from uh, though there is no evidence to prove that but then there is a voice note wherein wherein uh, I have changed the name of that girl uh, in order to protect her uh, identity but then it has been corroborated by uh, my interaction with uh, some of the investigators and some of the people involved in this case, that uh, he was uh, desperate to uh, uh, kind of recruit these uh, fidains, and he was so ruthless, and he was so uh, he had no heart. I mean, he would not even spare his girlfriend or his closest friend when it, when it came to his mission. Right. So, so, how did the 200 kg explosive reach India? That is one question that has bothered a lot of people, although there, of course, there have been reports about how uh, it was brought to India batch by batch. But in the charge sheet, if we look at the details, 200 kg is a lot of explosive. See, but that has not all come from Pakistan. I mean, when this bomb was assembled, it had about 35 to 40 kgs of RDX, 
which was brought in batches like when these militants jash militants they, when they infiltrate they carry in their rucksacks and they assemble it somewhere collect it somewhere and then when it is to be used they take take it out but then say certain things which are locally available for example urea fertilizer right it 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 can also you know it's a, it's a mixture of different kinds of explosives gelatin for example you have this you have these stone quarries in crew area right so that explosive is very easily available so 200 kg of all of it has not come from pakistan right okay but yeah. then i have i have tried to uh, give a fair picture of how this how these explosives were collected right. and some was some was brought by you know some of the ingredients were uh, bought by vazul islam on internet i have i written about that also ammonium powder and all that so right. only 35 to 40 kg of rdx which is used in this bomb was brought from pakistan right right so in fact uh, when you're talking about this bomb and how it was assembled um, there were questions about how for how long had they been really preparing for this attack so in fact you have also touched upon that topic in your book if you could tell our viewers that for a terror attack of this magnitude when did omar really come to india and uh, for how long did the preparation go on for this it's it's there in the book i mean right from his infiltration to his eventual killing in an encounter in sutsu kala right he stayed in india for little more than one year mm-hmm. uh let's say uh about uh, more than one and a half years he was here and uh, his at least these one and a half years of his journey in kashmir mm-hmm. is pretty authentic you know right uh, the, what he used to do in 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 back home in bahawalpur in pakistan i have uh, whatever little information i had because i researched so many things and i don't i don't have i don't have the uh, the, the the privilege of uh, actually get going into pakistan and doing the research and for obvious reasons you know that but then uh, i can fairly fairly construct his life in kashmir of uh, as as a militant as a jash operative for one and half years mm-hmm. starting from his infiltration till his eventual killing in sutsukala which mm-hmm. was on uh, 43 days after this pulwama blast right. and as far as the preparation for pulwama goes the reason has been uh, 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 very specific in my book it was done only to avenge the the death of his younger brother who was a, who was an expert sniper he died in october and immediately after that when he got this uh, very uh, uh, what do you say provoking and uh, sentimental kind of message from masood azhar Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently uh, usman his younger brother was one of his favorite nephews mm-hmm. and uh, he was really heartbroken when he was killed in a in a in an encounter in taral right. so it was the only motive behind this blast was to avenge the killing of usman alwi who was umar's younger brother right. so this also defeats some of this political narrative which was constructed around right. pulwama and you know i don't want to get into all that Uh, so in your book you've also spoken about how some of the militants including Burhan Wani and uh, Riaz Naik who were glamorized and how they used social media so which is a very interesting aspect because myself in, uh, when i went to kashmir the kind of popularity that you see uh, among people about these guys uh, who hail them as heroes what is the role of the police uh, in such situations because police is the one dealing with the people on a daily basis and there i think law and order problems also occur because of this gap that they these these people who are glamorized and you know hailed as heroes whereas whereas on the other hand the police are calling them militants they are calling them uh, people who join the terror ranks so how do you bridge the gap what is the role of the police in such a scenario see first i'll not agree with you that uh, these guys because of social media are very popular yes in case of burhan wani who had uh, uh, for optics he had used uh, social media uh, trying to uh, have a connect with you know youth of kashmir mm-hmm. but when you say that uh, a lot of people admire these people i i would disagree with that because a, a, a silent majority is indifferent to all this what is happening okay yes in some of these areas maybe there are certain disgruntled people there are certain unemployed youth who take a liking to these militants but then if you if you look at a wider and a bigger scenario i would not agree with the the fact that uh, the, the 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 fact since the you know these people are glamorized on social media so 
they, they have a lot of fan following nothing like that okay. as far as naiku is concerned naiku was a brutal guy he was a he used social media to terrorize people i mentioned about some of those videos of uh, beheading and uh, etc right. so 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 these people uh, used social media for their own advantage in in different ways and uh, as far as uh, police uh, countering these kind of measures is concerned yes we have got our own uh, 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 it uh, it within our police organization we have it experts we are also tracking down these people and obviously uh, these technology all these technological uh, measures are being taken and uh, uh, as such we don't want to negate to some of the fake news which is uh, which is not a problem only in kashmir it is a problem all over india and all over the world that right. you know hmm. so, so we have got own, our own ways of means to connect with people through social media hmm. and to counter these kind of designs okay so to write this book on a topic this sensitive and being uh, posted in a conflict zone how challenging was it and also given uh, your position and uh, the charge that you have where did you find the time if you could share some insights about that see uh, you uh, you will always get time uh, when you want to pursue something which is a passion with you right uh, we have uh, you know uh, we are very busy people all of us are but then uh, if you like something from your heart like somebody has said that if you get the job that you like you never have to work again so so in a similar way uh, even if you are busy at your job and if you there is something which is very passionate with you be it reading writing listening to music watching movies playing sports running etc you will actually find time for that right and so your biggest challenge while writing the book if you could share that experience with us biggest challenge was obviously uh, i didn't want to write anything which would uh, uh, be uh, false that is one secondly uh ideally i would have liked to write more about some of these uh, lives of uh, 40 brave hearts who actually right. died but because of pandemic i could not reach out to these people mm-hmm. and whatever information i gathered about them was through interaction with uh, some of their colleagues plus whatever is already there on public domain so yeah. i've used that material to construct their stories mm-hmm. but i would have definitely liked to visit some of their houses and interact with their family members so so that is where i find my book a little lacking because uh, i would have actually uh, paid them that ultimate tribute by visiting their families and you know knowing about their lives a little more no i think it's it's an excellent book sir because uh, the way it uh, sums up the entire pulwama conspiracy and it gives like as i said blow by blow account of how it happened how the conspiracy happened so thank you so much for joining us congratulations once more uh, on the terrific book as far as the sapton feels the pulwama conspiracy uh, which has been published by harper collins uh, many congratulations sir i uh, really hope that the book does well thank you so much for joining us today thank you <clears throat> thank you thank you for having me Thank you so much.